mission to collect, preserve, and interpret the material evidence of Jewish life in Florida. It began actually in 1763. And we have presented from those collections more than 50 different exhibitions since we opened in 1995. They are all based on Jewish culture, traditions, and memories of what Jews have contributed to all areas of development throughout the state of Florida. Why do we do all of this? We do this so that we can pass on the history and that these Jewish memories will help ensure Jewish continuity, help ensure that the next generations will be Jewish. After all, about 16% of the American Jewish community lives here in Florida. So we have a huge responsibility to make sure that this Jewish history that began in 1763 stays here and is continued to the future. Uh, I've mentioned 1763, but just real quickly for those of you that are not aware, the reason that is the date that Florida Jewish history began is because that was when people other than Catholics were first allowed to live in Florida. When Ponce de Leon discovered Florida for Spain in 1513, for the next 250 years, only Catholics could live here. After the Treaty of Paris was signed after the French Indian War in 1762, Florida was traded to Great Britain. And the English were desperate for settlement, and they let anyone settle, even Jews. So that's when the Jewish history of Florida began. It's also noteworthy to mention that the reason these synagogues are here, south of Fifth Street, is that because Jews were not allowed to settle north of Fifth Street when they first began to arrive on Miami Beach. But Carl, Carl Fisher, who developed Miami Beach, owned the property north of Fifth, and he had restrictive covenants in his deeds. So a little bit of the history, if you hang around the Jewish Museum at any little length of time, you will learn much more of the history, which is really fascinating and really important. So tonight's program is a very special treat, and that's why you're here. It's another example of Jewish contributions to the development of our communities. Shaping Lincoln Road Mall with Lapidus, Hertz, and Sirkin, the untold story, to complement the exhibit that is behind you of the same title. Three families shaped a place, one by design, one by vision, and one by ownership. How Lincoln Road Mall is the place we know it today owes its heart and soul to these men. Ms. Deborah Desolet is fully qualified to discuss this topic. She obtained her B.S. in architecture from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University in 1983, then worked with several firms. In 1996, she founded Virtual Visions Architects, Inc. and joined Morris Lapidus as associate and personal design architect. Among the many projects completed with Mr. Lapidus through 2001, when he passed away, are retail stores, restaurants, nightclubs, and city center, a 150-room hotel. From 2002 to 2009, Ms. Desolet designed nightclubs and restaurants while building her Morris Lapidus collection. I also want to recognize, before Deborah takes the podium, uh, the Sirkins, uh, Alan and Alicia Sirkin, as sponsors for this evening. Coming to Miami and working with Morris Lapidus was something that was a phenomenon, and I first met him through Architectonica. So I just want to briefly let you know that when I was working for Architectonica, that's when I moved into my Coconut Grove residence, and that's when I was living next to the Circans, and for me, that's really when the story began. So thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alicia, for your friendship for 20 years. And it's been very nice to meet Sharon and Steve at the same time. And thank you for sharing your father with me and the legacy of community activism and the reality of that in the shaping of Lincoln Road. And that is the untold story. What I began last year was to write a book about Morris Lapidus. Lapidus would meet with Carl Fisher's Lincoln Road after his eight successful hotels would fail the road. Each successive hotel, the fountain from the Sans Souci 
the Nautilus, the Biltmore Terrace, the Algiers, the Delito, which he did for on Lincoln Road, and then the Fountain Blow, the Eden Rock, and the Bal Harbor Sheraton. Each successful hotel was pulling the energy away from Lincoln Road as a road. Hal Hertz was getting nervous. He was the head of the Lincoln Road Association, and he knew that this did not forebode well for his economic engine and the bottom line. Hal Hertz would then put together an idea of forming a pedestrian mall, and he would go to Morris Lapidus and ask him if he would please design this. Morris would design Lincoln Road pro bono, and he would only charge for the draftsman's time. But he came back and designed Lincoln Road so that he could solve the problem that he had thought that he had or had been told he created. And that might have been Hal Hertz's good salesmanship, <laughs> that Morris would take credit for having failed Lincoln Road <laughs> as a road. Morris went before a group of people at the Seville Hotel in 1959, and he would say, a car never bought anything. And he would then proceed to define why we should close Lincoln Road. And I'm sure he was using the points that Hal Hertz had started. We've met three months ago. <laughs> and so all of this, I mean, came to be like three months ago. And it's really amazing because I remember talking to Mr. Lapidus, and he would say, Hal Hertz, Hal Hertz, Hal Hertz. And it was like this mythical guy who had a voice, had a vision, had an interest, but he had no mortal, I, I had nothing to put this with. I had no coat hanger <laughs> for what this guy looked like. And what a movie star, what a star. Uh, it's nearly 50 years since the Lincoln Road Mall opened. And I know that Dad is looking down and saying, wow. First of all, I want to tell you that Dad passed away 18 years ago, passionate until the very end about striving to ensure the best for the city he loves so much. I can tell you that when Dad was at home, he was writing, always writing. This totally self-educated man with only eight years of formal schooling had an innate ability to search his mind, because he never owned a thesaurus. He would search for and find the most potent words to present his ideas. Something like turning Lincoln Road into a pedestrian thoroughfare. Please note that by this time, Dad was no longer a Lincoln Road merchant. He was just a man who believed that his idea was absolutely critical to the future success of the road. Its completion would not bring him any rewards other than psychic, the joy of ultimately seeing his vision brought to fruition. And so, you can just imagine Dad's, our pride at the opening ceremonies on that historic day in December 1960, when the magnificent Lincoln Road Mall officially opened to pedestrian traffic only an exciting, gloriously designed shopper's mecca with graceful shaded walkways and seating festooned with sweeping architectural ornamentation and lush tropical plantings. The, the, the city and the population of Miami Beach was changing and the uh, economics of Lincoln Road was going down. Something had to be done. And Dad, who was not an artist, uh, took the picture from Esquire magazine and drew a sketch of his visions as to what the road could look like. And Morris uh, agreed with Dad that it would be a great thing to turn the road into a mall. And from that Esquire picture with the overlay, uh, Morris took the ball and ran with it and developed the Lincoln Road Mall as we knew it back in the 50s. The interesting part of that story is that there were 198 shop owners that Hal Hertz would have to convince to make this a special taxation district. And it would, have to, it would take him two years walking with this drawing that is so beaten up. So he would go to everybody, but there would be one owner that would stand in the way. And he had properties in the middle of Lincoln Road, and he had properties at the end of Lincoln Road. I can tell you that the genius of Pop Serkin cannot be questioned. 
you can see in the work that he worked with, with, Al, with um, Igor Polovitsky at the Albion, the work that was done at the Lincoln Center, and the work that you can see at the corner of Lincoln and Collins, the genius of Igor Polovitsky and the patronage of the Sirkins, it fit like a glove. The two men understood each other quite well. So you can't say that Pop Sirkin was doing this without giving it great, great thought because you could see that he was quite innovative with the building types that he was presenting. What's interesting about Pop Sirkin, I think, Alan should probably tell that story the best. I'm speaking from his genius from having observed the fact that he did some of the most, and supported I, I, Igor Polovitsky doing the, some of the most innovative pieces of ar urban architecture in Miami Beach, the making of Lincoln Road. Well, I'd just say that in the 1950s, the Sirkin family was the largest property owner on Lincoln Road, so they certainly had a lot of uh, incentive to, to see Lincoln Road be successful. So I, I guess I should just add and talk about comforts and about how we had such a limited education. Well, Grandpa Sirkin had even a more limited education, I think. You know, went through a religious school in Russia and came here uh, at the age of 18 or so uh, with, with no education and, and really not speaking English. And the guy was just a phenomenally intelligent man. And he just did so much with his life, uh, coming here penningless and, and turning things around. And uh, it was just great to be able to know him and, and, and learn things from him as I was growing up. I, I remember as a child growing up on Miami Beach, we used to go shopping on Lincoln Road before the mall was built. And uh, we used to park the car right in front of the stores because it was hot, as you probably know by today's temperatures, uh, to walk into the stores. Nobody wanted dressed up to, to walk walk around the mall. Uh, so when I was in high school is when they started designing the, uh, the mall and started building it. It was a uh, pretty outrageous uh, design for, for that, that time of, of life because it was uh, the striped concrete uh, ribbons and all these outrageously funny uh, bangles and beads and just funny shaped uh, oddities. And the, the, the truth was that, that Lincoln Road was in, in bad economic shape at that, at that time. Many of you may remember that. Uh, there, there was a, a project being built down in South, South Dade called Dadeland Mall, which was going to be, at that time, an outdoor mall. It was not enclosed. And that's where the growth was. All the young families were moving down to the Kendall area. And... Uh, my cousin Josh reminded me that at the same time, the, all the new hotels were being built with uh, arcades uh, down in the, on the ground floor where they had all the high-end jewelry shops and men's stores and women's stores and, and other stores. And all this was taking away the allure of, of Lincoln Road because these were all air-conditioned and, and all the tourists were there. They didn't have to go anywhere. So uh, evidently the... Uh, uh, idea was to try something new because it just didn't look, look like Lincoln Road was going to uh, do, do too well at, at the way it was. So, uh, as you said, they got together with, with Hal Hertz to do this. My fam I was a young kid at the time, so I don't know all the details, but my family at the time was, was very concerned about this as property owners because, as I said before, everybody was used to driving their cars up in front of the stores and now they would have to park a block away and walk, and there was a lot of concern, well, how is this going to work, and you know, would there be more vacancies, and would the stores move out even quicker? Uh, so I guess the compromise ended up uh, that, that they went ahead and supported the, the building of Lincoln Road Mall, but they wanted the first block of, of Lincoln Road to the east, where they had their two major properties, the Albion and the... Uh, uh, one Lincoln Road building and the Delito Hotel, that, that that would be exempted from the from the mall construction. So they, they were happy about that. And uh, the, the mall did get built, and unfortunately it didn't really, in the beginning, do what it was supposed to do. There was many years of, of uh, decline, continued decline on Lincoln Road Mall, and I think it was about 25 years before it became a fashionable place again, and now it's like, world-renowned. So it just goes to show you in real estate how things 
if you wait long enough, they, they, they just change. Nothing ever stays the same. So I think that pretty much covers it. I, I would like to recognize my two cousins that are here, Shana Sirkin uh, in the back, and, and, and Jill, and Jill who's over here. You want to stand up, Jill? When it became apparent to me that the um, story was bigger than Morris Lapidus designing Follies on Lincoln Road, what I learned was that Carl Fisher had come here in 1910 on a honeymoon with a young girl who was 15. And he had gone to New Orleans, and his boat failed. And it was sent to Jacksonville, no, no, Miami. So he wound up in Miami in 1910 with a 15-year-old bride when he was 35. And she woke up in the morning and she said, what is that in the distance? And it was Glitter Beach. But that was nothing, really. That was a spit of land. It was a barrier reef. And he would say to her, I will promise to come back and build you a city by the sea and the most romantic city by the sea. And that was his honeymoon promise to Jane. So the beginning of Miami Beach was in 1910 with a honeymoon. And Carl Fisher was in Indianapolis at the time working on a project called the Lincoln Highway. And the Lincoln Highway went from New York to San Francisco. And he named it Lincoln because Lincoln was raised in South Bend, Indianapolis. And so they considered him an Indianapolis man and he honored and respected him. There were two pictures above his bed at night, Lincoln and Napoleon. So when he came to Miami Beach, going by in the Raven, going out of government cut to go fishing that day, he noticed the bridge that was unbuilt by John Collins. And he asked, why is it not done? And they said, well, he ran out of money. The coconuts didn't make anything. The avocados didn't make anything, the mangoes didn't make anything, and the bananas were bruising by the time they got to market. So what was he to do? Carl Fisher said, I'll loan him some money. At that time, John Collins gave him 200 acres of land, and that was the land that went from 15th, from 15th to 23rd. And in the middle of that land was a natural path that had been cut out by the Tequesta Indians that were the, inheritance, that were the native occupants of that spit of barrier reef in the 1400s and related to the Calusa and related now to the Seminole. And that track of land with a little stream going on Lincoln Road, that would be the place that he would put Lincoln Road. In effect, Lincoln Road would be the mini-me to the Lincoln Highway. And he would then decide to build 77 acres of city and call it Miami Beach. And he would do that with the Loomis brothers, J.E. and J.N., and he would do that with John Collins. And the four of them together would work through rats, raccoons, rattlesnakes, roots. <laughs> and they would work through 32 different species of mosquitoes to tear down the natural environment to a point that they could then fill the swamp. They could dredge the, the bottom of Biscayne Bay with over 600 tons of, of fill. They could bring that to the top, go to the Everglades with barges, and bring that barge topsoil to Miami Beach and create Miami Beach from a barrier reef. This was the beginning. Carl Fisher always saw Lincoln Road beach to bay, and he would always see it as a vision of the greatest and the grandest shopping mall in the world, comparable to the Rue de la Paix, comparable to State Street in Chicago, comparable to Fifth Avenue in New York City. His wife, at the same time, would be enamored with Venice, and she would bring in the gondolas. So we have at the Delito Hotel the memic name Delito, which comes from Venice. And we see in the name Delito what looks to be an oar. Mr. Lapidus would cant back the 
um, background of that neon light because neon typically and light typically goes in, in and out at a 90 degree at the same angle it goes in it comes out. If he canted it at a 45 he'd create a fog and a mist and he would make neon look like it was floating. So at night, when the neon light for the Dolito is lit, it looks like it's a gondola that's floating. This is a very interesting use of light. I, I want to mention that telling the story of Lincoln Road became something that I didn't want to share as a Lapidus story, but as a community story, and also as a Roots story back to Carl Fisher to keep alive the memory of Carl Fisher in a way that is the love story of Jane and Carl because it was their love for each other and their love for a community that built Miami Beach in its original inception from 1910 to 1915. And we're on a countdown to a town, 2010 to 2015. These were the five years that Carl dredged, built, cut up, and worked with Collins and worked with the Loomis brothers to be able to make Lincoln Road what it is and to make the city what it was and also to get a causeway built to come over to finish a bridge and these pictures show that story the untold story of the beginning of Lincoln Road. I think the idea of Lincoln Road as a living artifact of our culture continues to this day and that's what makes it strong. I think it's very important in its 50th anniversary to congratulate the families that began it, to salute the tenacity of Hal Hertz, to understand the, the strength of Pop Serkin and his decision through ownership to stop the mania <laughs> in only eight blocks, to not continue at Beta Beach. I think that the powers that be that made Lincoln Road what they were, at this juncture at 50 years, if we take a minute and we celebrate it, we'll be able to understand where she wants to be in the future. I really do want to say just one other thing. It was modeled after a pedestrian mall in Rotterdam. And the fact that it is the most original, uh, in its most original state, and that it was the second pedestrian mall, as a national artifact, the State Department of Historic Preservation has taken an interest and so has Dakumomo. And Dakumomo has begun documenting Lincoln Road to put this before a national registry campaign in December of this year when Lincoln Road turns 50. If we would like to protect the work of Morris Lapidus, I can only tell you that in December we're going to ask the city to consider a national registry through a Dakumomo submittal. And that is something that every one of you can help with if you would like to have a voice with that. And I'd like to say thank you. That's the end of the presentation. Morris always said, emotion is data. I don't study architecture. I don't study geometry. I study people. And he would say, as I get older, architecture has less to do with brick and mortar and more to do with the human soul. Please people, make them happy. Why be exotic in private? I, I met Deborah just a little while ago. This has been her project to get Lincoln Road in front of the public, in front of the city commission, and to preserve the memories of Lincoln Road, how it was created, and what it means to the city of Miami Beach. I don't know if you all noticed, but she stood up here, no notes, and just talked. All right. This woman has a wealth of information that is absolutely unbelievable. You can sit and talk to her for hours, and she can name names, places, dates, things that nobody who has lived in Miami Beach all their lives even know. And her dedication for no self-serving purpose is absolutely fantastic. And Deborah, I just want to say on behalf of our family and the other families that are involved and the entire city of Miami Beach, we greatly appreciate your efforts, your dedication, your knowledge, and what you're doing. Thank you.
And we really appreciate your coming tonight, and we hope that if this is your first time, it's the first of many visits here. And if you're part of our family, thank you again for being here and help spread the word that this is indeed the jewel of Miami Beach, in addition to Lincoln Road Bowl. Thank you very much. Well, it was, uh, it was a pleasure. It was great to uh, have the family recognized. It's great to have my cousins here. Hey, it's great to be here, and it's an honor to have my family being honored. Oh, I think the Sirkin family has done a tremendous job in helping the growth of this community, and I'm just so glad and happy that um, their families being recognized. Happy to be here.